thank you for joining us this evening uh, for a discussion about the proposed privatisation um, of Channel 4. Um, it's going to be, I think, an interesting session and we've got some wonderful speakers. The first thing I need to do, though, is hand over to John Sailing, who's uh, one of the Guild's brilliant staff members, and he'll just take you through a little bit of housekeeping. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Lisa. Um, so just to let everyone know, the microphones uh, are muted and they will be for the duration of the event, um, unless you are invited to speak uh, by Lisa at any point. Um, but that just helps prevent things like feedback and ensures that everyone gets the best sound quality that they possibly can. Um, the session is being recorded um, and the recording is going to go up uh, onto our website and YouTube channel and be spread out through our, our social media um, as well. Um, the chat function is going to be operational throughout, so if you'd like to ask any questions, um, please do so via the chat function. Um, there is closed captioning available um, for anyone that, that wants to or needs to use it. Um, all you do is click show, show the show subtitles uh, part of your dashboard. Um, you can also choose between gallery and speaker view. Uh, it's say when you come with all Zoom sessions, which is the, those little icons at the top right where it says view. Um, and if you want to, you can turn your cameras off if you don't want to appear in the YouTube video um, while it's being recorded. Um, you're welcome to tweet about the session um, as we're going through it. Um, uh, that's largely it. Now, staff members are going to be available throughout the session. If you have any difficulties or issues, um, please just message one of us via the chat. So that's either myself, uh, Eleanor, or the WGGB admin as well. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed the session, and I'll pass back to Lisa. Thank you, John. Uh, I'll start by uh, introducing um, our guests this evening and thanking them um, for joining us. Um, we've got Carissa Hamilton uh, Bannis, who is uh, currently working on Hollyoaks as well as other um, development projects. In 2018, she was a BAFTA Elevate uh, writer. James Graham is an award winning, oh, he's across the board, theatre, film, and TV. Um, writer for Channel 4, he wrote Brexit, The Uncivil War, um, and uh, I can't read my own notes there, uh, Coalition, amongst other things. And of course, with the lovely uh, Jack Thorne, recipient of Outstanding Contribution to Writing Award at this year's uh, Writers Guild Awards. Uh, and for Channel 4, he wrote The Accident, The Virtues, National Treasure, This Is England, and Skins, amongst, again, uh, many, many things. And also joining us is Prof Professor Stephen Barnett, from, who is a Professor of Communications at Westminster, and he'll be talking to us about the political and social implications of the proposed privatisation of Channel 4. Um, I'm going to start um, by coming to you, three writers, and asking what Channel 4 has meant for you and your career. I'll start with you, Carissa. Um, yeah, so I'm probably, of the three of us, the, the newest to Channel 4. So I've been, um, I'm uh, working on Hollyoaks for the last two years. Um, it's, and I've got a couple of development things that I've been doing with Channel 4 and I've got one project that's in development with them now. I'm just sort of waiting to hear. And sort of it's quite hard in this country to get sort of work on screen, especially as a writer, a new writer or someone who doesn't come with a, you know, a whole bunch of credentials or, you know, like a uncle in the industry or a father in the industry. And when you're just sort of like trying to do it on your own, it's very, very tough. And that's one of the um, amazing things about the soaps is that you're able to get on screen, get your name on screen. And one of the most amazing things about Hollyoaks for me is sort of the, the YA youth oriented aspect of it, which is kind of where I'm coming from in my work because I was working with CBBC. And so working with Channel 4 has been really great for that just sort of allowing me to get credits, to get stuff on screen, to, you know, to, to write, which is, you know, what I want to do. And I think they've always been so good about being supportive and being open. The, the door's always open. And that's one of the things that I really sort of appreciate about Channel 4. So that's, I mean, the production schedules are crazy and I sort of understand that. And it's, it's you know, it's a really good learning experience. You're kind of thrown into the deep end, which, you know, there's something that I, adore I love I love being challenged and that's one of the things that I've really been able to do sort of working within Hollyoaks on Channel 4. And thank you for mentioning because so I think it's a really important of what the work that the Writers Guild do we a lot of our members are uh, so surprised but uh, all the soap operas so it's such an important part of the 
TV ecosystem, and as you said, offers good entry points uh, for a lot of people. Uh, James, what's what's Channel Four meant for your career? I mean, well, like a lot of people, for me, it started out as being an audience member and being introduced to to uh, British new writing and, and and international shows that I probably wouldn't normally have been able to to see. I think back to the things that just have really inspired me um, growing up sat in front of the television, uh, things like um, Alan Bleasdale's GBH or anything from Paul Abbott or things that felt uh, that they represented um, people from my from my social economic background. Um, so that's what started it. And then, of course, yeah, as Chris has said, it felt like uh, as you start to emerge as a, as a writer, um, that, you know, there are schemes and there is great support that come from other PSBs, including the BBC. Uh, but Channel 4 just felt like a, the, I think Chris said that like, the doors were open for, and their job was to find you, was to find your um, uh, talent, uh, if that exists, uh, when it was when it was still a risk and when it was still, uh, the impact was still um, immeasurable. Um, so I feel like in my work on Channel 4, things like the, the ones you mentioned, they say like coalition or Brexit, they were, um, you know, politically, had a political bent to it. And I really appreciated and was grateful for what felt like the nimbleness of um, Channel 4 and able to respond quite quickly to ideas uh, that didn't necessarily have to go through the understandable legal Ed poll stuff that the BBC has to do with the, with the greater government um, uh, uh, attention on it. Uh, and also it's, it, you know, it's remit was, uh, it's Thatcherite remit, ironically, was to be sub 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 subversive and mischievous and naughty and provocative and I don't think I would have been able to have done that. I mean, I know I actually got criticised for the Brexit drama for sort of being too kind to the government, which is, I think, a thing that you don't hear very much of anymore. Um, but, um, uh, you know, they, I don't think any other broadcaster could have or would have had the guts or the bravery to, to make that show and not know what the repercussions were going to be. Uh, so, yeah, I come as a fan, um, as an audience member and a grateful as a writer. Thank you, James. Uh, and same question for you, Jack. Yeah, I'm the old bastard veteran that's been doing it for a very long time. Uh, my second ever job was at Channel 4. I got uh, employed on Skins right from a play that I'd written at the Bush Theatre. And then they brought me on to Skins and I've worked there ever since. I think I've written 40 plus hours for Channel 4. Um, it, it is an incredible place. Uh, I think that subversion is right in its bones. And like James, I grew up watching it, you know, that I'm of the era when Channel 4 first came, first came into being. And that thing of, you know, watching film four uh, late at night with uh, Mark Kermode introducing strange films that you then sat and watched and understood cult cinema for the first time. You know, it, 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 it's everything like that. Also, it's constantly looked to challenge sort of media norms. Um, uh, I'm with another hat on, I'm a disability campaigner and uh, the first ever disabled um, uh, actor I ever worked with, I got on through through um, through uh, Skins that they supported uh, uh, casting someone with MS in the show, uh, which was huge. And then after that, we made a show called Cast Offs, um, and we made it for a very limited budget. We made it for a hundred grand an hour, um, uh, but they put it on, they supported it, um, and they made it happen. And that was an exclusively disabled led, uh, disabled active production. Uh, no one else would have done that. And in terms of nimbleness, I, I, you know, um, I made a show last year called Help, and uh, and we had to move quickly because we were telling a story about the now, and uh, and admittedly we had uh, Jodie Comer and Stephen Graham attached, which made it easier uh, in terms of you know getting that stars on screen. But they they moved with us, they moved at pace, they supported us, they supported our challenge. Um, uh, it's an amazing place, I think, but I am fully biased. And, and just to um, give my credentials, I'm currently making uh, a, a show for Channel 4 at the moment. So I do have a vested interest, but I care about And I feel the same way as you guys, um, watching foreign films like uh, Raise the Red Lamp and, and, and those kind of things as a teenager, I wouldn't have had access to them otherwise. And then great comedy and amazing news coverage and great um, documentaries from across the world, which I think is really important. Um, I, I jot down some of the words uh, that you were using there um, to, to celebrate uh, Channel 4, um, bravery, fresh, fresh, I think all three of you said that, nimble, accessible, naughty, provocative. Um, do you think there's any anybody who's doing that at the moment other than Channel 4 on British television? 
uh, uh, we're all waiting. Um, uh, uh, um, I, th I mean, I, I think there's there's a bigger thing behind that question, which is who is, you know, um, uh, we we are in a real challenge at the moment. I think the television landscape is in a real challenge. That people think that we're in the golden age of of, of television writing. I think as makers what we're finding is we're in the sort of post dream explosion and so there's a notion of what works and what doesn't work and how it travels and what that travel means and social realism which is the thing very close to my heart is under real threat uh in terms of i don't know whether you describe social realism as naughty uh gbh was both naughty and social realism so maybe um uh but but that that is it's going to become harder and harder to make stuff that's again a Tory word, distinctively British, um, uh, because in order to in order to make a show now, you need to attract international co-production money, and uh, and that co-production money comes with a sort of onus on how how can we sell this around the world? And if you're making a show as I was about a care home in Liverpool, um, that's a very hard thing to travel, uh, and who is going to do that other than Channel 4, I think is a real, real question. You know, certainly the BBC have got social realism right at its heart. But again, the reason why is because it's also a public service broadcaster. You know, we really, really, and that is also under threat. So we really, really need to protect, you know, the new authors coming through who are going to be able to say something about our country um, and and challenge our country. And I and I think if, if Channel 4 is got rid of, the space for those new voices is going to shrink uh, considerably. Thank you, Jack. Uh, I'll come to you, Professor Barnett. Um, the Culture Minister has said that this um, would help with the levelling up agenda. Do you agree with that? It's very difficult to agree with anything that the Culture Secretary says, frankly. Can I just pick up, before I answer that question, Lisa, I do want to pick up on, uh, it, it's, it's really because the, the levelling up argument is an economic argument. Um, and it's important. It's definitely important. Um, but I just want to pick up on the culture arguments because all three, uh, Carissa and James and Jack, have made some really important points. Uh, I was just jotting it down while they were talking, which tend to get lost because we are, uh, for political reasons, fairly obsessed with the economic downsides of privatisation. And I think the point that Jack just made about um, distinctively British is, so, is really important because one of the things that Nadine Doris keeps on saying is she wants to help Channel 4 uh, survive the challenges of Netflix and the streaming services and anyone who's watched Sex Education which I, I think was a brilliant series and is often quoted as a sort of you know it was made in Britain um, you know a wonderful example of inward investment by the streaming services will will know that there is nothing distinctively British about sex education, apart from the fact that it was filmed here and it had some good writers on it, some of whom were British. But it was made as a kind of mid-Atlantic, uh, designed to be marketed around the world TV series. Whereas if you take something like, you know, like Hollywood, Holly Oates, or, which I have to say, I mean, I know I'm much too young for it, but I, I do catch it the last five minutes before Channel 4 News. Um, but is, you know, that is a, a wonderful example of distinctively British soap opera. Um, the other thing that Jack was talking about was, was disability-led programming. And obviously Channel 4, we associate with the Paralympics, but it was absolutely the pioneer of um, allowing, giving disabled people the chance to be on screen, off screen, that, that that talent to flourish in a way that no other broadcaster could and all of that um not all of it but the vast majority of that is going to get at best diluted and at worst lost completely once channel four becomes absorbed into one of the big corporate entities because that's what the government is looking at um you know it would be swallowed up by Discovery or possibly ITV or one of the big one of the other big American corporates and they're not really whatever they might say and, and, and I'm sure everyone's preparing their scripts they're not going to be interested in continuing that kind of uh, that kind of 
culture. I think, I, I mean, James, I think, I can't remember, one of you said it, it had subversion, had a lovely phrase, subversion, only a writer can kind of come up with this. It has subversion in its bones, uh, which I thought was a wonderful phrase. And, and it, it, it takes something to be created with, within a public service framework to, to be able to have subversion in its bones. You don't get that within a corporate culture. And I'm not averse to profit making. You know, there, you know, ITV does some great stuff. So does Channel 5, so does some of the American streamers. Uh, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the, the notion of an institutional culture, which is what Channel 4 has and which will get lost. I've, I've, I've spoken for a, a, a good few minutes and I've not even addressed your question, Lisa. So I'm quite happy to pause there and let someone else carry on. Just a quick one though. It's, it's true to say that actually um, Channel 4 does make a profit and does very financially supports itself. Yeah, and you're absolutely. Yeah, you're absolutely right to pick me up on that. I mean, what I meant by making profit is returning value to shareholders. Yeah. So it is not beholden to shareholders. It does not have to maximise its profits. But you're absolutely right, of course. And it was uh, 2020. I think it made 73 million pounds, all of which, every penny of which, was invested in reinvested in programming, uh, and and you know in 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 paying the people who are you know, hopefully watching or listening in here to make great programs, uh, some of whom, um, you know, will be young, you know, will be inexperienced, um, will be having their first break. And I think going back to your question, Lisa, about about levelling up, um, the, the figures that were produced by e, the consultancy EY suggest that there would be I think I've got my figures right. Uh, Three thousand jobs lost of, uh, in, in in terms of the, the the number of jobs that Channel Four supports um, in the sort of the downstream. Over a third of those will be outside of London, uh, in the regions and in the nations, in precisely those areas where uh, the cultural secretary and, and secretary insists that, that she's really concerned about levelling up. So there'll be money lost, there'll be jobs lost, there'll be talent lost in those areas where the government uh, insists that it wants to help. So it's, it's completely illogical. The whole, uh, the whole rationale behind it makes no economic sense, let alone cultural sense. Thank you, Steve. Um, I, I'll come to, back to the writers, I'll start with James. Um, one of the things that, again, the Culture Secretary uh, seems very excited about is making Channel 4 like Netflix. Do you think that is something to aspire to? Well, <laughs> that feels very loaded, Lisa. Um, <laughs> um, um, no, I don't. But I think it's also fair to say that it, it, the, the, I don't think anyone on this on this Zoom will um, fall into this trap. But it, we can't be um, we can't accidentally find ourselves saying streamers bad, PSB is good because this, I, I absolutely adore all my subscription services with my streamers. I think they are. Um, I think they are creating really often really brilliant authored work that is creating jobs and, and is popularizing television drama uh, for, for uh, millions and millions of households. So it's not about us or them, but um, uh, no, that we don't, we absolutely don't need another uh, streamer in our, in our lives. And as we all know from recent news, uh, they aren't, it is a bubble. It's a bubble that is probably set to burst and is already bursting. It's going to, aggressively recorrect itself over the next couple of years. Um, I don't think any streamer is probably going to um, find itself in the situation where Netflix is currently, where it's entirely independently just making films. I think it will have to be attached to another business, whether that's making phones if you're Apple or selling products if you're Amazon. Um, so it is unfortunately really disingenuous of the culture secretary and anyone supporting this to say that the reason why this massive disruption for a for a successful uh, channel is due to making it um, more competitive in an imagined future problem that may or may not exist is completely disingenuous because it, there is absolutely no way that something that is currently provided free to the British public they're going to pay for. There's absolutely no way that given we all have three or four or five subscription services at the moment, we're going to add on channel four to that as a, as a result. Um, so as, a, as many people have always said, what is the problem that they're trying to solve? It's not that it's a public service that is entirely free to the public. It is a public service that takes no tax money and in fact makes a surplus. 
And it, as, as Carissa and Jack have explained, it entirely, it, it, like an incubator for new talent, it completely enriches our cultural life and, and trains new talent that actually will then go on to provide content for the streaming services. So no one, no one in government and certainly not the culture secretary has ever adequately explained one, either the problem they're trying to solve or two, why making uh, Channel 4 private is going to achieve it. And just to put the WGGB's point of view on this is that whilst we are in negotiation with some of the streamers, their working practices, what they're offering to pay writers, the buyouts they're offering are not particularly favourable compared to what you get paid um, by other public service broadcasters, so including Channel 4. Um, so it makes us very nervous that uh, the idea of Channel 4 disappearing and that work disappearing for writers. Uh, Jack or Chris, do you want to come in on that at all? Um, yeah, I just want to kind of probably echo or reiterate um, what James was just saying, just about the specificity that you get with Channel 4 programming is something that you would never get with the streamers, because like I said, it's about reaching global audiences. So even when you have like local content, you have like German and Korean and all that kind of stuff, all of it still is about reaching global audiences. And one of sort of the, the great things about Channel 4 is to reach underrepresented audiences, especially British underrepresented audiences, which is such a specific thing that if you sort of kind of smooth out all the sort of lumps and stuff, you won't get it. And in sort of privatizing Channel 4, you will lose that spe specificity because it's not conducive to making money at all. You want to go for the sort of the most, the, the common denominator and sort of being like, just like in sort of like a, like a care home in Leeds, like I said, it's just not something that's going to make money in the middle of, you know, Korea or India. But there's sort of stories there. There's there's so much um, intelligence there, so much groundbreaking stuff there that actually it will reach those people, but the shareholders won't see that. So you can watch a show that's so specific to such a small part and it will reach entire audiences. And that's where Channel 4 can make that stuff, can afford to make that stuff without having to answer back to shareholders who will be like, where's the proof that all of this works? And that's kind of one of the things that I love about Channel 4 and really appreciate about Channel 4. So I just wanted to echo basically everyone in different words. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, that's great. Thanks, Chris. And Jack, do you want to come in on this? I'm good. Good. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Van, I am going to come back to you and press you on the levelling up um, question. It, it seems to be something that the government are obsessed with, and, and I can see no argument for it, but, you know, let's try and be balanced. Is there an argument for selling it off um, to shareholders, and will that improve the levelling up, Jed? That... I can't see any. I mean, I've honestly, I have, I've watched her give evidence to the Select Committee. I've heard her and Julia Lopez, who is the junior minister, answering questions in Parliament. Um, and they, they, they basically have two talking points. One is the need uh, to um, face up to the challenge provided by the stream services, uh, to which one MP said, um, how many journalists have Netflix sent to the Ukraine? Uh, which I thought was a rather a good response. Um, and the other talking point is um, uh, uh, the, the, the need to, to um, protect Channel 4 uh, in, in terms of jobs. But the point is, it, it's actually been responsible for creating jobs in, in the creative sector. Um, so honestly, I mean, if you're asking for, a, if you're looking for a rationale, there is a rationale. Um, and Nadine Doris, in her more honest moments, has given it which is she in particular and some of her colleagues are mightily pissed off with Channel 4 News. Uh, and I honestly think, you know, it's as simple as that. They don't like the fact that Dorothy Byrne, who was for years Channel 4's Director of News and Current Affairs, called Boris Johnson a liar, which is, you know, finally, you know, the opposition leaders got round to it, um, you know, several months later. But she was the first to do it. Uh, and that is what journalists are supposed to do, holding power to account. Um, I don't think they like the fact that I think it was Johnson himself was replaced by a block of ice on one of their programmes, but um, because he refused to turn up uh, or another another Tory politician did. 
but she has said at one point that uh, you know, she, she, she's several times quoted Jon Snow, who had le allegedly said, excuse my language, fuck the Tories, um, and has quoted that as saying that, that hasn't helped Channel 4's cause. So I honestly think uh, yeah, a lot of it is about political revenge. And, and one of the things that I, you know, I, I'm always at pains to tell particularly international audiences of my students is that Channel 4 is unique throughout the world in being a completely commercially funded um, broadcaster, which has an hour of peak time, serious peak time analysis between seven and eight at the very moment that even in a digital world, broadcasters are trying to build audiences. You don't do that as a commercial provider. And I think that would frankly be the first to go. So That's... I can't, I, I'm sorry, Lisa, I, I would love to try and provide some political <laughs> balance, but there, honestly, there is no economic, let alone cultural rationale. Can I, can I say something? Yeah. Just, I think that there is someone that's got an answer to the leveling up agenda and, and it's got an answer to have, which is channel four. Um, and channel four are making a really decisive move to move away from London. Uh, that they talk about, they've released this document the next episode where at the moment they've got 300 jobs, uh, 300 roles working outside of London and that they aim by 2025, I think, to have 600 jobs working out of London. And as someone that I, I had, to, I moved to London uh, in order to work as a writer. I um, I came and I my brother had a place in Croydon and, uh, and, and allowed me to live with him for 150 quid a month, which allowed me to, to be a writer. I also worked as a teacher, but you know, I, I, I was able to work as a writer. We have to challenge that. We have to challenge the notion that in order to be a writer, you have to live here. And I, I know that there are successful writers that are living elsewhere, but there's, there's not enough of them. And it makes a really big statement that Caroline Hollick, the head of drama, lives and works in Leeds. Yep. You know, that, 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 that changes, that changes how, how the ecosystem of writing works. And so, yeah, the one, the, the one group that is answering levelling up is Channel 4 itself. Yeah. I, I th sorry, I, I think that's a really, really important point. And if we're going to give this government any credit at all, that is in response to the government's insistence that it should move out of London. So, uh, yeah, yeah, you're, uh, you're, you're completely right, Jack, to, to, to draw attention to that. But I think I'm right in saying that in the in the government's uh, plans for privatisation, they do not have that as a stipulation, being out of London. So. Um, it's brilliant that they have encouraged it and it's led to massive change, but now this threatens to undo the good thing that they've done. Yeah, completely right. The white paper says that it has absolutely nothing to say about where Channel 4 should be based or, or, or what provisions should be made for out of London working. I think that brings us nearly onto, onto a question from uh, Annie, which is what will Channel 4 look like if this goes ahead? You've already said there's no provision for um, any local and I, I speak to you from Leeds uh, where the headquarters are now um, I was part of the bid to bring it to Leeds we did a lot of Leeds uh, sold itself frankly it's an amazing place to be move to Leeds it's great um, so um, again I have a vested interest in this I really care that um, one of the scruffiest old nightclubs in Leeds is now these switch offices for Channel 4 it looks amazing in City Square um, the other thing that there is no, there will be no uh, obligation on the buyer if it gets sold is um, training uh, and uh, skilling people, um, which I think for those of us working in television at the moment is a terrifying idea because we are in a skills crunch at the moment. We are desperate for people to come into the industry. Um, do any of you want to come in on that and the, and the fear of that? Well, only in that it's so obvious, as you say, isn't it, that, um, that if, there, there, if there is no seemingly commercial imperative to either um, taking risks on, on, on talent that don't come from a particular background, um, or it's more expensive to find and make programmes outside of the M25, why would you do it? Um, why would you uh, have training academies, writing academies, writing programmes, initiatives, things like First Cut, um, which has an absolutely no financial profit in, in it. So why would you do that if you're answerable to your commercial interests and your your shareholders rather than the public? 
um, Carissa's gorgeous point about specificity of different communities and somehow that always finding an audience so the more specific and the more idiosyncratic and vivid you are if you find untold storytellers from from neglected worlds but and without repeating myself what is amazing about channel four is it does all that and it's still making a profit it is still making a surplus there is almost no other uh, um, subscription service that is not really 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 in debt so uh, so I, you know it's a gorgeous thing and i know a lot of us come from the world of um you know um not everyone but some of us come from the world of theater as well where we we're kind of more familiar with that dichotomy between subsidized sector and commercial sector and there's no one in the commercial sector in, in British theatre that wouldn't say we are entirely indebted to the subsidised sector in training and giving voice and empowering uh, voices um, using using public funds that, we, that then the commercial sector can use to carry on enriching the cultural landscape. Um, so, uh, yes, it's a, I know we're all being incredibly bleak, but it's, yeah, there is no, if there is no financial imperative for a commercial entity to train uh, neglected voices and people, they won't do it. Can I, can I just bring one thing up, Lisa? I mean, you, you, yeah. you say that there's nothing in, in the white paper, that there'll be no obligation. Um, the, the, the suggestion is that there will be some obligations placed on the sale. Um, so they've said there will be an obligation to provide news. Um, there might be an obligation to, for, 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 for diversity, etc. The problem with any obligation, it, well, there are two problems. The first, that the more you have, the less value it becomes. So if part of the, the rationale is actually to raise money for the Treasury, which we've not talked about, um, estimated to be about one billion, which is petty cash, frankly, um, the, the, the more obligations you place on it, the less money you're going to get for it. But actually, the much bigger problem is that history has taught us through ITV and Channel 5, that a commercial company will progressively pressurize the regulator to reduce those obligations. They will go cap in hand, as ITV have done several times, for example, over its regional news coverage, and say, we can't afford this, you're damaging our profits, we can't reinvest, our shareholders are up in arms, you must reduce these obligations. So even if you put in trading obligations, diversity obligations, innovation obligations, news obligations, they would be gamed. Uh, they would be gamed and then eventually they would be diluted and quite possibly dropped altogether. And that is the difference between a commercial operation and a non-commercial public service operation. And I, I come back to what I said before um, and you know the, the, the point that Jack made is about institutional culture. The institutional culture of Channel 4 is not about making money, cutting corners, diluting obligations. It's actually the opposite. It's aspiring to, to, to do as much as they possibly can to fulfill those obligations. And that's a huge difference. Thank you. OK, one more dark thing, and then uh, we'll get on to what we can do about this, I promise you. Um, my understanding is there's also no obligation, as you say, every obligation um, knocks a, a little bit off the asking price, a bit like a bad roof on a house. Um, my understanding is there's also no obligation for uh, Channel 4 to carry on making movies, to make cinema um, if for the buyer. Um, I, I don't know if we've got anybody on the panel who's, who's developed work for Film 4, etc. How, how does that make you feel? as a writer, the idea that that big film producer in the UK might disappear. I've, I've, I've made some film for. Film uh, I thought you might have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, yeah, it's, I remember saying to Tessa Ross, I'm really sorry that the film didn't do so well. <laughs> and, her going, and her going, uh, it was an investment in you as well as an investment in the film. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, we, we believed in what you guys could do and uh, the guy who directed that film is now making a film for Netflix for 150 million. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, so in terms of that investment, it, you know, it paid off in him at least. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I, that's, you know, yeah, I love Film 4. I've always loved Film 4's films. I think that they make incredible films and it would be a tragedy if they suddenly stopped making it. Yeah, I, I feel much the same way, even though uh, Iron Man is with us 
uh, this evening and I do love a blockbuster. I also love those little films. I love things that are extraordinarily British and, and um, intimate. And I think Channel 4, uh, Film 4 is, is amongst the best at, at making them. Anybody else want to come in on, on the dark, um, bleak future um, that we are setting out for ourselves here? Yeah, I just have one more bleak thing to say, just about kind of it's the the having Channel Four and having that kind of all those obligations to sort of serve communities that are underrepresented are so important, and I think more important than anything because of the ability to allow people to see underrepresented groups as people, as to 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 give some humanity to people that you don't know. I mean. I have, I have a friend who comes from a very small town and she didn't see a woman with a headscarf her entire life until she came to London. She, and so to her, all she had, all her representations were sort of the Daily Mail and sort of news, the news and stuff that's not obviously gonna be very, allow her to sort of see the, the humanity in people and being able to sort of serve all these communities and they are British communities. They are British communities, they're just smaller British communities. And to see all of the colors of this country and all of the beauty of this country and all of the, I'm gonna say specificity again, all of the specificity of this country is so important. And losing, cha losing Channel 4's sort of obligations will lose that for us. And we'll, it will also allow for more ignorance, I think. So it has a sort of a far more social kind of implication just than just sort of the monetary one or just sort of an entertainment one. There's a social one because most people, they get their ideas and their, their views of people that they've never met from TV, from the screen. That's how they know anything about anyone because they, don't, they might not have the chance to meet people. And something that doesn't sort of serve all these communities is going to, it's going to allow for sort of more dehumanization of people in this country and that's something I think is so important. There was a scope survey that said that only 36 percent of uh, no that 36 percent of people have never met a disabled person. Now that's probably bullshit because they probably have met a disabled person they just didn't realize they were disabled but at the same time you know yeah unless we get those stories told on screen where will that access point be? I completely agree with everything yeah. And so do I. And I think, you know, we, we often as writers, we talk a lot about um, g giving voice to people, but also, as Carissa said, that it was, what's gorgeous about drama and film is it allows audiences to be introduced to those people as well in worlds they don't necessarily get access to by being physically uh, away from them. And just looking at some of the films Film Four had made long before we, uh, and again, I'm not doing anyone down, but, you know, before the age of Heartstopper, there was beautiful thing and I know Jonathan Harvey's on this call or there was East is East or my beautiful laundrette and this was all before that was um you know seen as empowering by by streamers these these were decisions made impossibly can you imagine what an American studio would think about this a studio that has no obligation to make money just to break even if they possibly can um it's just such a beautiful to quote Jonathan Harvey such a beautiful thing and I still don't know why I just don't know why we won't take such a risk to, to disrupt what is essentially a success story. Literally, as we're, as we're talking, the, the um, obviously uh, Channel 4 started in 1982, and so I'm old enough to remember it, it starting. And, and as we're talking, shows that um, I think formed me as a person, as a writer, uh, keep popping into my head. Um, everything from Euro Trash to they were the first channel to have friends on in the UK, ER, the things they bought in, everything um, that I, that made me a writer. I think Channel 4 was about the comedy as well. I, I, could, I could go on, I won't. Now, I lied when I said um, I'd done the last Blake thing, and I just want to come um, to Steve again. And, and, I, and I, I am asking you to um, uh, speak in Mrs. Dory's voice again, but she says that the privatization of Channel 4 will improve things for independent production companies and for anybody um, on this call who doesn't understand, um, Channel 4 does not make its own television programs. It commissions uh, a myriad of independent production companies to make every single show for them. Again, it feels like something that's not broken that she's trying to fix. Am I right about that, Steve? Yeah, it's 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 not broken. I mean, I'm I'm not quite sure what she thinks. I, oh, it's the old problem. You know, this is a this is a solution in search of a problem. Uh, and I've, I've I've given you my theory about what's really behind it. I, I, what's interesting is that if if 
she really thought this was going to be good for the independent production sector, then you'd have thought that the main industry body representing independent producers would be backing her. Um, and I'm sure as people in this call will know that the main industry body is PACT uh, and PACT is vehemently opposed to this. One, one of the stats that stands out for me is, and this comes from PACT, is that Channel 4 is responsible for 15 new uh, independent producer commissions every year. That's 15 uh, brand new untested uh, production companies given their first commission by Channel 4 each year uh, who would not be given the chance and I presume that that you know I would hope that some of those filter through to you know the writers and the, and the talent on this call so um, that is not a model that is going to be helped by privatization Let, let's be clear I mean you're absolutely right Lisa that, that Channel 4 was invented as a publisher broadcaster so uh, purely to commission, the government has made it clear that it will abandon that model, that one of the um, conditions of privatization would be that the, the purchasing company will be able to make programs in house. Uh, and, and therefore, the value that is currently uh, filtering down, not just to the independent production companies, but to the writers and all the attendant uh, industry jobs that flow from that will be taken in-house and hence the loss of jobs uh, that is likely to go with it and the, the, the refocusing, the reconcentration uh, of those jobs around London, uh, which is you know, completely the opposite of what the government says it, it, it wants to do. Um, so I think you know, that, that, I think someone said at the very beginning, this was a Margaret Thatcher invention precisely in order to inject some competition into the broadcast market and allow small independent producers the chance to flourish. And it succeeded brilliantly. I mean, you could argue that there are quite a few very, very wealthy independent producers, too many of them American owned. Yeah. That's a different issue. Um, and I think there is, there is an argument for saying some of the privileges that, that they have, uh, they are allowed, to, it's called terms of trade, it's quite technical. Uh, could be reduced. But in terms of the overall impact on the number of small and medium sized production companies given the chance, uh, the, the, the role of Channel 4 is huge and will certainly diminish with, with privatization. Fantastic. And, and uh, to be clear, Channel 4 don't own studios, um, film, equipment to film, they sit out of crews in place because they've never needed them before. So Whoever buys Channel 4, if they want to do that, is going to have to make a massive investment in that, which surely seems, not, again, all of this seems nonsensical, but um, the more you scratch the surface of it, the more uh, mad hatter it gets, I think. Well, it's worse than that, Lisa. They, they wouldn't have to make a massive investment because the whole point is that there almost certainly be a massive vertically integrated produ uh, 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 producer like Discovery, for example, that already makes programmes. So, you know, th there will be the, the, the value that currently goes into independent production companies will simply be taken in house and will be lost. Amazing. Thanks, Steve. Um, thank you to everybody who's sharing their favorite Channel 4 um, shows in the chat. Comic Strip Presents, Brookie, Queer as Folk is getting a lot of love um, as well. Um, so do feel free to, to carry on doing that um, in the chat. So now, to the positive things, what the hell do we do about this? So obviously um, the Writers Guild is gonna make it one of their main campaigns uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, I'll come to you again, Steve, what, what can we do about this? And is this hopeless? No, it's absolutely not hopeless. Uh, on the contrary, in fact, after Monday night, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm actually quite optimistic. I think there are two things, first of all, uh, this was not a conservative manifesto promise, which means that constitutionally it can be opposed and defeated in the Lords. Uh, almost certainly there is a majority against this in the House of Lords. Uh, I'm 95% I'm confident of that. Um, uh, what will happen there? So it, it, it will then go back. They, the, the Lords will do two things. First of all, they will defeat it as it is currently um, proposed. 
and they will then uh, try and introduce some wrecking amendments to impose so many obligations that it becomes commercially unviable. Um, so that will certainly delay it. In the end, the Lords will, given the majority that the government has, probably have to concede, but it will, they will certainly put spanners in the works. The main thing now is we know that there is conservative opposition. Even before Monday night, you had people like Jeremy Hunt, former culture secretary, uh, Ruth Davidson, uh, Damien Green, former cabinet minister, all expressing their opposition and saying this was a bad idea. We now know that there are 148 rebels, some of whom have outed themselves, uh, one of whom, um, I can't remember his name now, also a, a, a former minister, uh, uh, the MP for Herefordshire, anyway, Jesse Norman, actually wrote a long letter which included, uh, made mention of his opposition to Channel 4 in the letter. So those MPs are going to be looking for a possibility of saying to the government, we're not going to be rolled over, we're going to express our opposition to the Prime Minister through actions in the House of Commons. And I actually think this is one issue where it is not, it is quite possible to get 30 or 40 MPs who, are, who do not like Johnson, do not like Nadine Doris to vote against. And that's all it needs. All it needs is 40 Conservative MPs to vote against, or 60 if you include abstentions. So I think a concerted campaign which identifies those rebels who outed themselves, uh, people who, especially who are resident in their constituencies. If you, as the Writers Guild, can organize and say, just locate your MP, find out if they're one of the rebels, and tell them about your personal experience in having, uh, in, with Channel 4, being commissioned, getting your first opportunity, uh, the money that it, the, the, the jobs that it's that it created, uh, the money that it's provided to that area, that makes a huge difference. Um, and I can tell you, and I've talked to an awful lot of parliamentarians about this, the, the stuff that comes in from constituents, giving their own personal um, experience, which is not the result of some kind of 38 degrees campaign or whatever, uh, makes a really big impact. And if they're any way predisposed to voting against their own government, uh, I think this is an issue where um, they may well be persuaded to do just that. So, unusually, and this is often not the case for a Writers Guild campaign, if you live um, in a constituency that has a Tory in, it, uh, in power in it, actually, you you might have a chance of, of making a, a big effect. Often it feels like if, if you've got a Tory in your constituency, there's absolutely uh, no point, but actually doing a bit of uh, letter writing, emailing, and putting a bit of pressure on might might be useful on this occasion. Sorry, what, what might be useful? Uh, putting pressure. If you have a, a Tory for your MP, putting the pressure on. Absolutely, on no, no. I, even better. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The the, the opposition MPs will be um, almost universally on side, including the SNP. Um, it's the Tory MPs, it, and, and those of you who live in constituencies with with a Tory MP. Actually, even if they are big government supporters, it is worth writing. It really is an individual letter ex with, with, with your own experience and why Channel 4 has really mattered to you. Um, uh, ideally, couch in economic terms, but there's no, no reason for not talking about things like diversity, for example. Um, but, it, but if you can couch it in, in terms that the government is speaking in, i.e. levelling up economic investment, inward investment, jobs, um, that will make a difference, uh, and and it's more important when it's when, as I say, it's personal experience rather than I'm just writing as part of a concerted campaign. That's fantastic. So, um, for our members on the website now, under the Channel Four uh, campaign, are some form letters um, for you to have a look at with lots of facts and figures. There's a brilliant MythBusters um, document that John Sailing has written, basically bursting apart Nadine Dorries' uh, argument as we have uh, this evening. Um, we would urge every single member to have a look at that and write to your MP, especially if you are um, within a, a Tory constituency. Um, 
those re uh, resources will say up there, we are going to continue to campaign on this. Uh, we will speak to uh, parliamentarians at the all, all party groups that the Guild attend. We'll be working with our sister unions, uh, Equity, the Musicians Union and the Directors uh, Unions um, to uh, confront this. There is across the board condemnation of this. So that's the positivity. Um, Jack, Carissa, James, will you be writing to your MPs? Yeah, but I think my MP is already on side anyway. So <laughs> they'll be like, yeah, we know. <laughs> but I'll do it anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can try. My MP at home is Lee Anderson, who is uh, becoming an a bit of an interesting star. Oh, 30p Lee. Exactly. Um, I do think it's, I suppose, I do, do think I think it's interesting, though. I, I mean, about, because obviously, as we know, the, the, the and I, I, as Steve has sort of been saying as well, there's, there are a lot of conservatives that are against this because it is fundamentally, whatever your own politics, this is not a very conservative policy. It's a populist policy. Yeah. And as we know, because of the nature of this particular government, um, any, um, any uh, uh, conversation that's had from the industry will be disregarded as biased because they, they, and frankly, I think as we all know, they'll be quietly thrilled that we're all meeting tonight because they'll be able to paint it as some liberal elite metropolitan bullshit bias thing. Um, they don't care about that. And so I think there's a really important question about who are the best people to make this case and champion it. And I know that it's certainly in the case for, make, for arts funding um, last year or during the pandemic, there were some quite successful grassroots movements uh, that, were, that were built, especially locally, people who just did not want their local theatre to close. Um, and that was much more successful than um, famous actors or movie stars making the case just for that reason, because you can't dismiss it as being a, an elitist not, um, thing. Um, so I don't know what equivalent there is for Channel 4. And I, the one thing I think I've, the only thing I've ever agreed with Nadine Doris saying, uh, I think was the committee meeting where she, she said most people when polled don't necessarily know what the funding structure for Channel 4 is, or even that it's a public service broadcaster, which I actually think is its strength. It's, they don't know that because they don't freaking pay for it. Um, they just get all the benefits from it. So I don't know what our obligation is, or dare I say our failure is, for, for frankly not making the case for public service broadcasting around Channel 4 or even the BBC or any argument again. But um, I worry a bit. I don't know what I don't know where it comes from. I worry. I, I, it's just a question about who are the right people to make this case, and I right. suspect it might not be necessarily all of us. But I think we can um, be a positive force in that conversation. We are talking with expertise, and we, it is our jobs at stake here, and we have a right to say that. But I think alongside that, adjacent to that, any any public campaign that can be built, I think, is only to the benefit. Can I? Can I? Can I just take slight issue with James on that? Um, I, I, I worry when I hear people worrying about being labelled liberal metropolitan elite, because I think we are in danger of ourselves um, being hoisted on the Daily Mail's petard. Um, it's their narrative. I don't think I don't think it's a universal narrative. I understand. I, 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 I get what you're saying. But actually, I think most constituent, constituency MPs, even government loyalists, who hear from someone who is personally involved, are not going to think they're just a member of the Liberal Metropolitan Elite, particularly if it's not North London or you know, Islington, where I'm based. <laughs> ha. Um, you know, it, 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 when, it's, when it's an individual and it's personal, it's very difficult to level that charge. Um, and I, I, you know, I, that's why I was sort of stressing individual writers rather than this is a Writers Guild campaign. Um, I, 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 I think that makes a big difference. But I, I, you know, I understand. I think, I, I, think I think that's really true. There's nothing I disagree with that. And I, just to be clear, I don't support that narrative. I think it is their narrative and I think it's ugly. Uh, and I think um, you're right. I think individual experience, um, is really vital it's just a question about alongside that yeah what public public articulation we can uh, help facilitate expression of brilliant thank you uh, do chris and jack want to come in on, on this at all I, i'm good the only thing i'd say is is it possible on on the writer's guild website that you also link to the next episode that the um the channel four the channel four document about their future because it really yeah. is remarkable what they're planning 
um, and it's their answer to the to the provocation by Nadine, and um, it's a remarkably brilliant provocation, uh, a remarkably brilliant response to that provocation. I think. That's right, and, and I think Channel Four are, are sticking up for themselves, which I find um, really refreshing. John has put the link to our campaign uh, in the chat if anybody wants to open it up to have a look at. After as I say, all the resources are, are there. Um, I'm glad we're ending on um, a positive note. I think I think this is ultimately um, a chance to, to give this government a bloody nose, and I do think um, it's defeatable. We have yet to find anything within it that, that makes um, any sense. Um, so thank you to everybody who has uh, come on to this call, Mr. And I'm going to give the last word uh, to our panellists. If, if there's anything you want to say in summation, whether it's just a call to action, uh, I'll start with uh, you, James. I think I've said everything, but just, yeah, um, uh, yeah, to reiterate, uh, well, I'm really glad this conversation is happening um, um, and that there is such a united front and a united voice on this. And it's hard not to, as, as Steve has been saying, when you're faced with such an irrational, um, an irrational proposition, uh, it's hard not to unite uh, completely against it. Um, so yeah, my love for Channel 4 is undiminished. Uh, it contributes positively to our cultural life and there's absolutely no reason to risk its, uh, risk, its, risk its success. Thank you, James. Carissa? Um, yeah, it's just to say what I haven't said before, just how important, I mean, Channel 4 kind of was what I watched growing up. It was the only place where I could find things that I could relate to or I could understand. And it was only the only place that sort of sparked my imagination because, and it is also one of the few broadcasters that really focuses on sort of young people and young programming and programming and YA programming, which is so important because it's such an age of discovery and it's such an age of risk. And I think having a broadcaster that's willing to take risks and be a part of that is so important. and. I just, I don't think we should lose it. And I don't think, and I think it's so important that they are owned by us, the people, we are, and that we are able to influence the, their programming in some way. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm very, very heartened by this discussion and by everyone on the call and by just all the sort of everyone. I, I went looking for sort of counterpoints just, just before the discussion and I could, I could hardly find any. The only counterpoint I could find was someone saying, what's been on channel four that I've watched recently? And I was like, I can name yeah. like things, so no. So yeah, for, for me, that, that sort of sums it up. It's more, it's a personal thing for me as well, but I also, I see the sort of economical and all that kind of stuff as well. It's very important too. Fantastic. Um, Steve, and then I'll come to you, Jack. Um, I put in the chat a link to a, a campaign group that I'm involved in called the British Broadcasting Challenge. Um, there's a lot of stuff on there, papers, um, data, which people can borrow from uh, if they're if they're writing uh, just a bit of sort of um, overall economic and policy context. Um, I, I I just wanted to say one more thing, which is again about about the, the or two more things about the politics. First, there was a consultation on um, privatisation, which uh, the government launched last year. Uh, they promised that they would take notice of it. The first question was. Do you agree the, to the effect of do you agree that Channel 4 should be privatized? Uh, I can't remember, there was something like 60,000 responses. 96% said no. 96%. Now, about two thirds of those were part of a campaign organized by 38 degrees, even excluding those, because that's the point Doris always makes. Even excluding those, 94% said no. So obviously, these are engaged people. These are not. You know your average uh, person that you meet on the doorstep etc but um there is pretty much universal opposition to this the second thing i want to say is politically uh, i've spoken to people who are involved in the a couple of the lib dem campaigns in the so-called blue wall seats um and obviously it's not exactly a cost of living crisis type of issue but it is coming up on the doorstep I, I mean, I doubt it would come up on the doorstep in Wakefield, but certainly it is in Tiverton. So uh, there are certain kinds of Tories, Tory MPs, who might be thinking about this uh, because it uh, it does say something about uh, the, uh, the somebody used the word cultural vandalism, 
that, that there is something sort of vandalistic about it that uh, really offends certain kinds of people who might be sort of lukewarm, you know, centre-right uh, conservatives. So obviously it's not going to be uh, a, a sort of a polling issue, but it is sort of in the background for some kinds of people. So again, I would say it is really worth pushing this politically. Fantastic. That's again, that's very encouraging. So, and Jack, I'll give you the second to last word because I'm having the last word. I, the only thing I'd say is I don't that, that I think this is an argument not about our broadcasting past. It's about our broadcasting future, and our broadcasting future is going to be very difficult for for British storytelling, and we need to protect it. We need to protect the next Sally Wainwright, the next. Jim McGovern, the next Alan Bleasdale, and uh, the next Michaela Cole. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, and if they and if we're not protecting them through the public service broadcasters, where else will they get protection? And and so, you know, absolutely we're looking back, but really what we're doing is we're projecting forward and and there are big threats out there. There are big threats out there to the future of our writing. And uh, and that's what we should be fighting for, I think. Well said. Thank you, Jack. That's perfect. Um, thank you to Jack, Carissa, Steve and James for joining us today and being part of uh, the Liberal Elite. I'll let you know my mum's very proud of the fact that I'm part of the Liberal Elite now. Uh, and Wakefield's a very feisty place. It won't surprise me if there's a bit of it on the doorstep. Um, thank you uh, for joining us, for your comments um, in the chat. They've been fantastic and your reminiscences about the shows that shaped you as writers. Please, please. Um, go to the, our resources page on the on the website um, and engage with this campaign. If you would like to get more involved with the Guild, um, my, my email address is under contacts um, on the Writers Guild website. And if you'd like to um, talk to me about how you get more involved with our craft committees, our national committees and our regional um, organisations, um, we have amazing staff who have big things up their sleeve for the future of the Guild. Um, it is a, a real honour to be part of such a campaigning organisation, and this is going to be a very major part of our campaign. Our AGM is next month. If you'd like to have any say whatsoever um, on how the Guild is run, um, and you can just email me with general comments if you want. Um, my email's always open. Um, thank you again to our panellists and thank you to you for engaging with us. Um, you're fantastic, our members are the best in the world. Um, and that's it. Thanks a lot and good night. <laughs>